All right. Good morning, everyone. So glad you could join us for our Sunday worship today. Uh, hopefully you are staying cool in this uh, pretty crazy heat wave. I was actually in Palm Desert over the weekend for a wedding, and it was like 116 there. So this is cool for me. But for everyone else, the AC is on. Hopefully we can uh, stay cool again. I heard it's like the hottest it's ever been. And so uh, we'll endure. God is always worthy despite the weather. And always thankful to uh, worship and share God's word together. Uh, if you're new or visiting, I want to welcome you. My name is Sam. I'm part of the pastoral staff. And this is the time of year where things kind of kick off after a su- somewhat of a summer low. So looking forward to community groups kicking off. Particularly for those of you guys who are members or becoming members, I uh, highly encourage you to consider serving, not just to serve, but that's a great way to get connected. I always say community groups is not the end-all, be-all of connection, but there's a unique, I would say, need that is filled in terms of community life when it comes to not just being together in community, but serving together in community. So that's something that uh, I would encourage you to consider, look up, and sign up for. And most likely, I will, at this stage, be the one talking to you. So I'd love to get to know those of you guys who are interested, even if you just want more information about what it would look like to get more plugged in to help church function uh, at our church. That being said, if you're joining us for the first time, we have been going through a sermon series through the book of Leviticus. And to catch us up for the past 16 chapters, uh, we've been seeing chapter after chapter of this simple reality that is, to be honest, quite forgotten in our modern day and age, which is this reality that God, the God of Scripture, is holy. God is absolutely holy. I wonder if you came into worship today reminded and realizing that fact, that you're not just coming into a theater at a high school in Bonaparte, Park, but you're entering the very presence of a holy, holy God. And especially in the Old Testament times for Israel, they knew this in a very visceral sense, that you couldn't just waltz into the presence of a holy God, that you had to take appropriate caution. If not, there would be legitimate consequence. At the same time, we've been learning even more abundantly clear that even though God is holy and by nature there's a distance between a holy God and sinful people, he is a God who wants to bridge that gap. He wants to be with his people. He wants to dwell with his presence among their midst. So that's where we've been seeing. That's where the tabernacle came from. That's where God provided a way through the priesthood and through offerings and sacrifice. And most notably last week, kind of the fulcrum moment of the Day of Atonement, where the sins, both known, unknown, committed, and omission, all of that was taken care of so that sinful man could be in God's presence. And all of these things were to teach not only Israel, but even us today, what it means that Not only that God is holy, but it looks like for us to walk and be holy. Now, if holiness in the first 16 chapters was more understood in the concept of being ceremonially clean and holy and ritually clean and holy, uh, for the next two weeks, it takes a shift from chapter 17 to 26 to kind of the ethical and moral dimension of holiness. So there was the ritual cleanliness of holiness, and now there is what's called the moral, ethical side of holiness, or to put it another way, so far Leviticus has described a way into God's presence by being holy. Starting from chapter 17, what you see is now what it looks like to walk with God by living in holiness. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Leviticus chapter 19, or it should be right there in your program. It's a long chapter, so I'm just going to read from verse 1 through 16, and then we'll skip to the very end to the final two verses in verse 36. To 37. As we turn there, if we could all rise together as we open God's word, as here at our church we believe that God is present, moving, and speaking through his word every time we read of it. Leviticus chapter 19, starting from verse 1, this is the reading of God's word. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you is to respect his mother and father. You are to keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to worthless idols or may cast images of gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. When you offer a fellowship sacrifice to the Lord, sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It is to be eaten on the day you sacrifice it or on the next day, but what remains on the third day must be burned. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it is a repulsive thing. It will not be accepted. Anyone who eats it will bear his iniquity, for he has profaned what is holy to the Lord. That person is to be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not act deceptively or lie to one another. Do not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages due a hired worker must not remain with you until morning. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but you are to fear your God. I am the Lord. 
Do not act unjustly when deciding a case. Do not be partial to the poor or give preference to the rich. Judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people and do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Skip to verse 36. You are to have honest balances, honest weights, an honest dry measure, and an honest liquid measure. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Keep all of my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am the Lord. It's the reading of God's word. Let me pray for us. Father, we pray that your spirit would illuminate your word to speak a message that resonates deeply within our hearts, gives us clarity to Christ and the gospel, and most importantly, uh, gives us a conviction to know what it looks like that not only you are holy, but you call us, your people, to be holy. So bless our time, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So every now and then, I don't know about you, one of the things that I love to do, particularly in moments where I'm feeling lazy or I'm feeling just apathetic about life, I like to listen to random TED Talks. That's kind of my way of like, I need to just get my brain stimulated and get my body moving. Uh, And, you know, a lot of TED Talks are usually based off motivational issues or topics. And I'm curious if anybody here knows the most clicked on, or at least top three clicked on TED Talks of all time. It was given by an author and inspirational speaker named Simon Sinek. Anybody hear of him or know of him? So it's just me, huh, that watches TED Talks. All right. Well, Simon Sinek, his TED Talk was based off his best-selling book, and the book is called Start With Why, W-H-Y. And again, there's a reason it was the most clicked on, because even though the book itself is a leadership book, the principles he shares are universally applicable to life. That's what got resonated with so many people. And the main message of that talk and of his book is actually pretty straightforward. And in the TED Talk, if you watch it, he has a whiteboard. And he's trying to visualize the main message of his book. And he draws on the whiteboard what he calls the golden circle. He says, this golden circle should revolutionize your paradigm for how you understand how to find purpose, find meaning, and have a conviction in life where you're living a meaningful life. This applies whether you're a leader, whether you're starting a business, and I would argue there's even connections to how you are living as a Christian. Now, if you think about it, that simple one-word question in the center there of why, I think it's one that many of us would benefit from, from, benefit from, from reflecting on in almost every aspect of our life. How do I know this? For one, a lot of you work really hard. Why do you work so hard? (laughs) You don't have to be working so hard. Uh, Why do you choose to do things that you do? Why are you here? Why do you be in relation with certain people, not other people? That why question, it kind of enters a different sphere of reflection that, to be honest, not a lot of us like to go to because it forces us to get to the center of why we do what we do. I'll never forget the day when one of my close friends who wasn't a Christian, it was, I think, back in high school. We grew up together in elementary school. He knew I was a pastor's kid. He saw all the Christian things I did. So I'd say, hey, Friday nights, I can't hang out. Got to go to church. I serve the church. I give up time. I sacrifice my energy. I sacrifice my money. And he saw all these things I was doing. And one day he simply asked me, like, Santa, can I ask you a question? And I said, of course. And I thought he was going to say, like, can you tell me, like, who is Jesus? Can you tell me, like, what's the church about? But he asked me this question. He said, Santa, why are you a Christian? And I was so stumped by that question. You know why? Because if he had asked me, what does a Christian do? I could have given him a two-page essay response. I know exactly what a Christian does. I've been doing it my whole life. But the why question wasn't so easy to answer. And this wasn't just me. Simon Sinek in his talk, he actually talks about the golden circle, the why and the answer to your why. Most people actually don't even really know. The how of your why, of how you go about living out your conviction, even less people know. But ironically, everybody knows the what. If I can describe the order of how you live your life, if you live outside in, meaning you live based purely of what you do, you are living a conforming life. You are conformed to what everybody else does. You don't know why you do it, but you just do it because that's what you think you're supposed to do. A conformity-oriented life. This doesn't just apply to a cultural thing. This applies, dare I say, as fearful and scary as it is, to Christianity itself. If you just do what Christians do, but you don't know why you're doing it, that's what's called a Christless Christianity. You are doing Christianity without Christ, and it's very possible to do. Pharisees did it all the time. Whereas, if you live inside out, your why is driving your why, your how and your what. That's what I would call you are living off conviction. And it's so missing today. So missing for Christians today. I share this because many of us, my hunch is that we have a strong theology and doctrine regarding the what of Christianity, but I think many of us have a disproportionate understanding of the why. 
I think for many of us who grew up in the church, particularly the Asian American church, the what of Christianity has been so pounded down your brains and your life. And not only in Christianity, but for my upbringing, whenever you were told what to do, if you asked why, you know what the answer was? Because I told you. (laughs) Just do it. You don't have to know why. I told you to do that. And I wonder if that's bled over even to our understanding of Christian living. Why should I go to church? Just go. Why should I tithe? Just do it. Why should I serve? Just do it. That's what you're supposed to do. Here's the problem. And we're experiencing this in our church too. The older you get, the what of Christianity becomes increasingly hard to do the more you forget or distance yourself from the why. I bring this up because that's precisely why it's so important to read and see the Bible as a story instead of a moral rule book, right? Because a moral rule book that's only seen as commands, that's isolated from story and narrative, doesn't that sound like a lot like a bunch of what? What to do. What not to do. Do this. Don't do that. And it just registers down not the core of the why part of your life, but simply the outer courts of pure action and religion. And if taken out of narrative context, it's so easy to get lost in the what while not realizing the deeper why. In relation to our text and where we are in the story of Leviticus, the simple question then is this. Not did God save Israel, not even how did God save Israel, why did God save Israel? Why did God rescue Israel from slavery? And by extension, why does God rescue us today from our sin and slavery? I would argue based on the text, one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, that to be honest has become kind of an extinct way of describing what salvation is about, is that God saved Israel and by extension saved us who call ourselves Christian even today to make us holy. Let me tell you from the text, Leviticus 20, 26, speaking to Israel, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart. In other words, I have made you holy, set apart, distinct, different from the neighboring nations and in the world to be mine. You are holy and you belong to me. And in case you think that was just an Israel thing, 1 Peter literally quotes that and says to all New Testament Christians, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So this message is clear. We got to be holy. Now, the concept of holiness is massive. There's so many layers to it. So in today's text in particular, we're going to see how does Leviticus 19 prescribe and describe what holiness looks like. And the hope is to get a little more color and clarity, not only what holiness is, but more importantly, why should we even care to pursue holiness in our life? So we're going to look at it in three ways. Number one, the call to be holy, which is the why. Number two, the practice of being holy, what does it look like? And third, the power to become holy, how do we even go about doing that? So first, the call to why. So to give a little context, commentators all label chapter 17 to 26 of Leviticus as what they call the holiness code, because the emphasis of this part of the book deals with God's standard of holiness in very everyday, day-to-day, daily living decisions. And chapter 19 in particular is crucial, especially for Israel back then, but helpful for even us today, because it was arguably the clearest description of what it meant for Israel to live as a holy nation, right? Prior to this moment, even in Exodus, when God says, I call you to be holy, it was a little bit arbitrary. But what you see is in chapters 18 and 20, which are sandwiching 19, it's all about what not to do. Don't imitate Egypt. Don't be like the Canaanites, but in 19 sandwich between, it is the highest moral ethical code that we see throughout the entire Old Testament about what does holiness actually entail. And then they needed this description, and it's a reason why even we need it today, because if he just said, be holy, what does that even mean? What does that even look like? Like, a similar example is when someone says, like, can you be more loving? Right? Is this not a, a spouse's usual cry for each other? Hey, can you be more loving? Can you be more loving spouse? It's like, amen to that. What does that mean? Does that mean you want me to come closer to you physically? Does that mean you want me to actually give you more space? Does that mean you want me to do the dishes? Does that mean you want me to hold your hand? Does that mean you don't want me to hold your hand? We could use a little bit of detail of what practically what that means. And God, knowing that, he says, I'm not just going to say be holy I'm going to literally paint down in a nitty-gritty way what I mean by be holy. So chapter 19 gives us that summary. And so much, some even call it the Old Testament Sermon on the Mount for that reason. It's describing a kingdom ethic for Israel. And so much of the New Testament actually derives from Leviticus 19. 
Jesus quotes from it. Apostle Paul quotes from it. James quotes from it probably the most in the New Testament. Peter quotes from it. So it's a very important book. And with that foundation laid, let's look at the clear call in verse 1 to 2. If you look at the text, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses up there as well. Speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now a couple of things to note here on the call. First, the call to holiness. Notice, it was to the entire Israelite community. It was not just to the priests, not just to the leaders, not just to the holy huddle that seemingly took their faith a little more seriously. I know for a lot of us growing up, that's kind of what we would label people who are like the serious Christians, right? Or like they're the holy ones. Well, what I would say is like, what are you then? (laughs) The unholy ones? Makes absolutely no sense. The call to holiness was to everybody. There was no exception. Second, the call to be holy, notice here, there's no option. It doesn't say, Israel, can you consider holiness? Because that would be really cool. Can you try it out and see if it works out for you? It's as clear as day. Be holy. It's a command. It's a command from the God. You have no option. This is what you are to be. And in case we think this is an Old Testament thing, as we read earlier again, Peter reiterates it. Jesus even says you have to be perfect. You have to be holy as your Father is holy and perfect. So every single professing Christian sitting here today, let me remind you of this. God, through the authority of his word, calls you to live a life in pursuit of holiness. When's the last time that you had that framework of Christianity? You are called to be holy. You are called to care about being holy. You are called to make decisions based off being holy. Now, I'm sure you might be thinking, so what does that even look like? Let me pause you there and listen to the wise words of Simon Sinek. Before we get to the what, let's start with the why. Why should I even care to be holy? Why in the midst of the busyness of this life and priorities and stressors and work and trying to raise a family or keep up my social circles or go play golf, why should I care to live a holy life? I'm very glad you asked. The primary reason given the text, it says very point blank, Be holy because I am the Lord your God and I am holy. If I can put it in layman's terms, be holy because you belong to me. This phrase, I am the Lord your God, I don't know if you caught it when I was reading the text. This was fascinating to me. The phrase, I am the Lord your God, occurs a total of 40 times in the entire Old Testament. I don't know if you know, Old Testament is a very long book. 40 times. Almost half of those uses, 16 of those uses, is in chapter 19 alone. That's pretty pointed, meaning something about this statement, I am the Lord your God, is tied to our motivating why and factor behind why we should pursue holiness as God's people. And the chapter closes with this important detail in 35, 36. It doesn't just say, I am the Lord your God. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is absolutely critical to remember because God is saying not be holy and obey me because If you do that, then I will rescue you. He's not saying be holy because if you do that, then I will be your God. No, what do we see here? The Israelites were not expected to be holy in order to become God's people. They were expected to be holy because they are God's people. They were not expected to pursue obedience and holiness to be rescued. They were expected to be obedient because they are rescued. He means... Even in the Old Testament, the why behind obeying God's command to holiness was built on grace. It was built on grace. Now, in the case of Israel, it was because why? God has rescued us, redeemed us, saved us from slavery in Egypt. Now, Christians sitting here today, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. For Egypt, for Israel, it was God has rescued us from slavery. A lot of you guys do a lot of Christian things. What has God done for you? To make you do these things. Who is Jesus to you? Like why do you call yourself Christian? Like really, really think about it. Because if you don't have answers to those things, you're wasting your time if you really think about it. Like why are you here? 
What should profoundly unite all of us who call ourselves Christians is this gospel reality. No matter what ethnicity, no matter what age, life stage, background you have, we were all once dead in our sins, living in darkness, blind to our need for God, and the amazing grace of God, which becomes increasingly more amazing in life through the sacrifice of Jesus and the power of spirit, rescued us, not unlike being rescued from slavery in Egypt, but in a more profound sense, brought us over from darkest to life, that's what God has done for us, and that's what's the why. In other words, do you believe that, though? Do you believe this? We pursue holiness because that's what we've been saved for. That's what we've been saved into. And it is an Im- immensely personal call that he is saying, do this because I am the Lord your God. It's intensely relational, and it's intensely more about, if I can phrase it this way, more about belonging than it is about behavior. It'd be like if my wife, Angela, says, can you do these things because I'm your wife? Can you not do these things because I'm your wife? She's not saying, can you do these things to be a good husband? That'd be more behavioral. She's saying, because you belong to me. I belong to you. Let me illustrate this. Every Saturday, including yesterday, if you have a Find My Friends, you will find me either at a park, an outdoor playground, an indoor playground like yesterday, a swimming pool, a splash pad, or if not, at home pretending to be a monster with a blanket over my head. If I ask some, one of you, like a postgrad, mid-20s, and you're single and not yet married, you don't have a family, and I said, I want you to change your behavior. Every weekend, I want you to go to a playground. I want you to go to a park. And every now and then, I want you to put a blanket over your head and pretend you're a monster. Would you do it? Probably not. I wouldn't have done it if I was my 20-year-old self. So why in the world do I do this absurd behavior? Because my behavior flows out of the relational belonging that I have with my kids. I belong to them, they belong to me, and I don't go to a playground or act like a monster to be a dad. I act like a monster because I am a dad. Let me use another more example. If I told you to go around after worship and I said, hey, can you, just like every hour or so, can you like behaviorally do this motion? Yeah, just do it. You would think that's really weird. Did you know like half the guys at our church do that? They'll be like talking and they'll be like, hey, bro, like... And nobody questions it, you know why? Because the other guy's like, ooh, yeah, yeah. What are they doing? That's so weird. You're, you're exhibiting strange behavior. You know why they're doing that? They belong to golf. And golf belongs to them. You don't have to teach overflowing behavior from belonging. It just happens. But if you try to create behavior without belonging, it won't last. It's powerless. Christless Christianity. When you do something out of your belonging, it doesn't make you belong. It shows that you do belong. God doesn't say be holy to be a good person or to be moral and do right things. He says be holy. Why? Because I am your God. I love you. I have redeemed you. You belong to me. You are set apart for me. And if Jesus really is the Lord our God who has made us his own and we belong to him, don't you think that serves as a pretty significant why to our what? So in summary, why pursue holiness? We belong to God. We belong to his kingdom, not the world. So our identity, our ethics, our loyalties by definition ought to be holy to him. Set apart for him, representative of him. So that's the why, but what does it look like to the practice of holiness? Let me make one concrete statement based on Leviticus 19. Contrary to maybe a lot of popular thought and opinion, holiness is immensely practical. I was floored by how practical holiness actually is. You see, I'm sure for a lot of us, when we think of what it means to be holy, don't you think of something that's kind of like, amorphous, indescribable, transcendent in nature. Like when I Googled holiness, Google has no idea what holiness is. So you know what it did? It gave me a bunch of pictures of clouds and, and doves and people like raising their hands. Isn't that what we think of holiness? Just kind of like this vague, general, like spiritual reality. The problem is if that's what you think holiness is, you will never be holy because how do you measure that? Is it just this subjective feeling? Is what's holy for you, not holy to the other person? And I love how one commentator puts it. He says, contrary to much popular theology, holiness is definable. 
Holiness is practical. Holiness is even measurable. But further, when it comes to holiness, those who have been redeemed by the grace of God are responsible. We are to pursue the practice of holiness in our lives. And because of God's saving grace, we also have the power to do so. Now, there's a lot of commands in chapter 19, as you guys saw. I couldn't even read all of them. We read about half of them. But I want to kind of give a bird's eye view about a good number of them just to show you how practical and how down-to-earth holiness is as described by God, okay? Number one, honoring your father and mother is a practice of holiness. You ever think about that? I want to be holy, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to honor my parents. Resisting idolatry, making sacrifices willingly, remembering the poor, dealing honestly with others, not dishonoring the name of God, just being a considerate master, not taking advantage of weaker people, avoiding gossip and slander, lovingly confronting when it's called for, not holding grudge. This is just like real everyday life. And this is the picture of holiness. Being a Christian is very practical. In fact, in the New Testament, James literally says, you want the ultimate picture of pure religion? It's not fold your hands and sing kumbaya. It's visit orphans and widows in their affliction, in their trouble. Isn't that measurable? Isn't that practical? In other words, I can actually look at your life and tell you in a concrete way, biblically speaking, that you are pursuing holiness or not. Now, there's a lot of laws related to practicing holiness given, but let me make a few general observations to help organize what's going on in chapter 19. First, when you look at the laws, you realize that the practice of holiness as prescribed in Scripture, it is utterly comprehensive. Utterly comprehensive. When you read the laws, it seems like a random list of laws, but if you look at the nature of the laws from verse 3 to 18, there's actually a general sequence in order. So, for example, in verse 3, it starts with the home life. Very personal, very private, how you honor your parents, right? How you keep Sabbath. Then it transitions in verse 5 to 9 to worship and peace offerings and the sanctuary and and, and offerings. But then in verse 17, it goes beyond the religious and the ritual and it goes to now society overall. How you handle your workers, how you handle your crops, how you handle society and communal relationships. In other words, though the list is not exhaustive, it is intentionally put together to be comprehensive. It is absolutely all-encompassing, and that's actually a big part of our church's mission. I don't know if you knew. Our church's mission, which I hope the members know, is to raise passionate followers of Christ for all of life, a comprehensive discipleship that is rooted in what the Bible itself says true Christianity is. And if you categorize Leviticus 19 and you ask me, so what are the categories it deals with? It, talks, it touches on family, work, worship, business, personal relationships, sex, justice, dealing with the poor, how you treat foreigners. Isn't that pretty comprehensive? Public, private, civic responsibility, ceremonial responsibility. And what this means then is there's no act of obedience too small to be considered holy if done for the Lord. I know a lot of us tend to think holiness is like the grandiose acts, like selling all you have or going on missions. But did you know how you treat the elderly reflects your holiness, according to this text? How you try to honor your parents reflects holiness? That in moments where you choose to be honest, when you could lie, reflects holiness? When you care for the needy and the poor, it reflects holiness? How you conduct business and strive to be a person of integrity reflects holiness? It is absolutely comprehensive. Second, the practice of holiness is communal. And this was very big for me when I actually realized this. A lot of people, when they think of holiness, don't you think of like the apex of a holy person is like a monk or like an ascetic who's basically given up all that they have, shaved their head, and they live this devout life of piety, and that's like the picture of holiness. I would argue from the text and the standard given by God himself, holiness in its truest form is impossible without community and connection to others. Like we saw earlier, the call to holiness was a communal call to the nation of Israel. He didn't say, I'm raising up a nation of holy individuals. He says, I'm bringing holy individuals to comprise and become a holy nation. Church, he's not saying, I want you all to be individually holy and pursue that because that's what I want. He's saying, in your individual pursuits, I want you to be a holy church. So when God says, be holy, grace, O church... It's not less than you pursuing holiness individually, but it means you not only care about pursuing holiness in your life, 
you care about pursuing holiness in my life. And what that means is if I'm not pursuing holiness, something is missing in your own pursuit of holiness according to God. That's what's going on here. God is communicating a communal standard of holiness in which every true community rooted in Scripture and God has a foundation built on this shared pursuit. We're pursuing holiness together. I wonder if we could describe our church that way. One thing we are at our church is we are all striving to be holy and pursue holiness together and help each other do that. If I can share a quick note on this pastorally, I truly believe we need to rekindle a passion to pursue holiness as defined by God through his word, not just as individuals, but as a community. And here's the thing. I think for a lot of us have such a shallow view of what this looks like. So if I tell you, hey, in community groups this year, let's help each other pursue holiness, you're like, amen. You know what 99% of you are going to do? Here's what you're going to do. I want to help you be holy. Are you reading your Bible? And are you praying? They'll probably say no. And you'll say That's tough. You should try harder. Pursuing holiness. Is that what's going on? Did you know, nowhere in chapter 19 is there a mention that the quintessential practice of a holy life are reading your Bible and praying. It's not even mentioned. So where did that come from? Is that not a cultural construct that the epitome of holy living is read your Bible and pray? Did you know reading your Bible and praying if the ends to themselves are not even spiritual in nature? There's so many Bible scholars who aren't even Christian. There's non-Christians who pray way more devout than Christians do. Those things are not the godly things themselves. It's what does that lead to? What I just put up there. Holy living is the telos goal. So instead, you know how you help me be holy in community? You don't just say, are you reading your Bible? You say, how's your relationship with your parents going, Sam? Is it broken? Are you trying to honor them? Because I think the Lord is honored in your desire to want to pursue holiness in that Or if you notice, or if I notice one of you is like losing sleep, you're chronically stressed, your body's telling you something's wrong about the way you're approaching life, and I find out you're just obsessed with making money. All you're thinking about is success in a worldly sense, and you are literally losing Sabbath over that. What I will tell you is, hey, you should really consider slowing down. You're acting as if you are the one in control of your life, and you're really not. How can I help you? How can I help you with that? I'm helping you pursue holiness in that moment. Do you kind of see how if you limit holiness to be this two-hour window of Christian religion that we're sitting in you right now, then we can't ever truly pursue holiness in everyday life. And I think scripture, so much of it would be irrelevant in that case. Holiness is a group project and we can only effectively pursue a life of holiness together and we have to normalize this to our day-to-day realities because that's when our church's mission can be fulfilled following christ in all of life and so to the degree that we pursue holiness together to that degree we will be blessed and to the degree we ignore our corporate responsibility to that degree we will suffer the third aspect of holiness which i think is more visceral and personal to me the practice of holiness is life-giving Life-giving. Here's what I mean by that. I'll never forget, uh, again, youth group. Youth group's a very formative time, right? Uh, a pastor shared, we were, I was with a group of brothers, and we were talking about the hot topic of lust, right? And this is not just brothers. Sisters struggle with it too, but brothers in particular, we were talking in a group of small group, and he was talking about lust. He was talking about sexual morality. He was talking about pornography. And one of the brothers in my group, uh, newer to the faith, he kind of like rebuttaled and challenged the pastor, and he said like, Pastor, I got a question. Why does God restrict us from having sex if everyone around us is doing it and it's like bringing them pleasure? Like, why would he do that? It seems so, like, restrictive and it kind of robs us of, like, joy and pleasure. And is it not true a lot of us have that view of, like, holiness? There's, like, what I really want to do and then there's what God's calling me to do. So I'm going to do what God calls me to do and forego my happiness. If that's your view of it, you'll never really truly enjoy pursuing holiness, Right? And it's a fair question for the teenagers to ask, but again, the root of the question, which I think a lot of us struggle with, is this understandable but false belief that on one end of the spectrum is holiness, and on the other end of the spectrum is happiness, and they are these divorced oil and water realities that will never coexist or can't be together. So if God is calling you to be holy, he must not be calling you to be happy. Nothing could be further from the truth. And what the pastor said in response has stuck with me ever since. He said, you know, contrary to what you might believe, holiness brings happiness and purity brings power. 
That quote stuck with me very, for a very long time, obviously, if I'm bringing it up today. Because essentially what I think he was communicating is embedded within the pursuit of holiness is actually God's desire for his people to walk in the path that is truly the most ultimately life-giving and joyful. Truly. That as a good father, why would he give bad gifts to his children? Why would he withhold any good thing? And I love how the quote doesn't say holiness is happiness. You know why? Because a lot of times holiness doesn't feel good. Holiness feels like pain. Holiness feels like suffering. Holiness feels like discomfort. So it doesn't say holiness is happiness, but it says the ultimate fruit of holiness is holiness ultimately brings results in and fruitions into the truest form of happiness, which scripture would say is communion and fellowship with the Lord which is what Leviticus has been all about. In other words, God commands us to be holy, and as a loving father would do, offers loving boundaries and restrictions not to enslave, but to truly liberate. And this is all the more difficult to embrace. I get it. That's kind of one like those air statements, like how does that actually play out? So you're telling me by not doing what I want to do, I'm going to be happy? Like what does that even mean? And especially in a culture that falsely believes that rules, restraints, and laws are the opposite of freedom, our modern culture has literally twisted freedom to mean do what you want, when you want it, how you want it, with who you want it. Can I just tell you, that's just so false. And I'll give you a very small example of this because it happens with my son Ezra. Do you know what the most unloving statement I found in my heart when I said to Ezra was? Do whatever you want. When I am most in love with Ezra, I am constantly giving him restraint. Just yesterday, we got a mochi nut, Fruity Pebbles mochi nut. I said, you can have one mochi nut ball. That's the good thing about mochi nuts. You can kind of you know, turn them into like little donut balls. I gave him one. He said, can I have another one? I'm a people pleaser. I was like, fine, you can have one more. The third one, I was like, you can't because you're going to have sugar. And there's countless situations like this where him and Zachy will act out. They, they'll literally think their life is over. Like, like Appa, you're robbing us of joy and, and pleasure. And sometimes they'll push me to the limit to the point where the love in me has sapped out. I have nothing but wrath and rage. And do you know how it plays out? It doesn't play out on me smacking them. It says, fine, do it. Do whatever you want. Yeah, you, you decide what's best for you. Like, Appa is done. I'm checked out. I don't care anymore. Do what you want. So what's fascinating is no matter how much the people of God infinitely rebel, infinitely are acting like little children before God, God never stops pointing the loving restraints of holiness and happiness. How does he do that? Parents in here, you know that's hard to do. And that's literally what God is doing. And he does it not just for individuals, he's doing it for the nation. For example, let's do a simple case study. Do you realize when God is talking to Israel and saying, be a holy nation, here's what I want you to practice. If you break down what God is actually saying, if Israel were to obey, this is what kind of nation it would be. Listen to this, I'm going to describe it. It would be a society where sinners find peace with God, the poor find genuine welfare from thoughtful landowners who are not hoarding, workers receive their wages, The physically impaired are protected. The courts retain true justice. Neighbors are combating violence together. The land is cultivated and not exploited. Daughters are protected. Elders are honored. Refugees are well treated. And business is conducted with honesty. Does that not sound like a happy, joyful nation? Does that not sound like what literally, with the elections coming up, all of politics is supposedly trying to get to this kind of society, and yet we are doing it in a failing manner, because we love the ethics of the kingdom. We just don't want it with a king, as one pastor famously says. So to put it simply, pursuing holiness from the smallest to greatest act is life-giving in the most ultimate sense. Do you believe that? Do you? If you're wondering, how am I supposed to remember all the different commands and laws, though, Pastor Sam, even if I wanted to live this way? Two quick notes on that. Number one, that's why you need to know your Bibles. (laughs) So many of you guys have been taught to read your scripture starting with a what? Memorize, know, read. So you're like, why in the world do I do that? But if the why is because this is the way, as the psalmist say, to true life. Your words are life-giving. They are like honey to my soul. They are what protects me against sin. If that's your why, how do I do that? Know the word. 
Let it fill you up. May you be saturated with the word of God, not as this religious what, but the what to your why of I want to be holy. And secondly, it helps to know, if you want a summary, a Spark Notes version, all these commands, it boils down to love the Lord, love your neighbor. If you're doing those things, you're doing the law. Now, if you're like me, as you hear about what it means to be holy and walk in holiness, I'm sure you feel more unholy. (laughs) You feel more unworthy. How much we fall short. Because I know I've pastored this church long enough. I know for the vast majority of us, we actually would love to be holy. We would love to live this kind of way. In other words, the desire is there, but the ability and capacity to carry out, that's what kills us. That's what's hard. And you seem to fail more than you succeed. Is that not true? So you know what happens in this perpetual cycle? If I were to kind of give a generic overstatement of this, usually past your prime of your 20s, when you start getting older, you start having kids, there's two things that usually happen. You either stop trying really because you think, what's the point? I failed enough that it's just going to be a cycle of shame. So I'm just going to really kind of be a middle class, mediocre, lukewarm Christian, just get by. Or what you do is you kind of shave off the standards of holiness and you create this attainable standard and you actually become very prideful and you start judging everybody. How come they're not as faithful as me? Look at what I'm doing. These people have just given up on their faith. Both are really bad options. You're either stuck in a cycle of shame or you're stuck in a cycle of pride. So what's the third option? How do you actually have the power to be holy in its truest form? Uh, One of the things I know a lot of people experience as they get older, and I've heard this time and time again in our church, is as you grow older, you have a deeper appreciation for your parents. Right? This is just something that's universal. And it's not uncommon to hear a lot of people like, hey, it wasn't until like after I got older or, you know, I had kids of my own that I rekindled my relationship with my parents. Particularly, again, a lot of new parents at our church, particularly when people go through like pregnancy and birth, for some reason, magically, what they'll tell me is like, I love my mom. I'm like, why? Like, what happened? It's like, I just like had a firsthand experience of what she did for me, what she went through, and it made me like love and appreciate her even more. And what's fascinating about that is we all get it, but did you know it's not like the mom did anything? Like the mom didn't do a new sacrifice. (laughs) She didn't give birth again. It's almost like this old thing that has new meaning in life, not because what they did changed, but because your perception and experience of it changed. And that in turn affects even how you want to see, relate to, and approach them. Make sense? Why do I bring this up? To take it full circle, I shared in the beginning that the pursuit of holiness and the desire to want it in the first place all starts with that. Why? And the why of true biblical Christianity revolves not around an object or an action, but a person. Jesus. Jesus makes or breaks your how of how you live life and your what of how you live life. So no wonder if your personal understanding of what Jesus has done for you and who he is to you is a 4 out of 10 in terms of significance, why would anyone in their right mind want to answer the call to a 10 out of 10 comprehensive pursuit of holiness and surrender in your life? That's why you see so many Christians who confess Christ, but what they're confessing is a 4 out of 10 not truly comprehensive understanding of who he is and what he has done, and their life cannot help but reflect that because what flows out is what's from your why. If Jesus did a nice thing for you, you will do a nice thing for him. Make sense? That's what's going on here. And this is where it's really helpful and interesting to see one clear example of Scripture where what I would argue the true power to pursue holiness truly lies. If there's anyone I would say is the standard of holiness outside of Jesus in the New Testament, I'm sure Apostle Paul would be right up there. Right? You would think so. The man literally penned half the New Testament. He was a missionary, planted many, many churches. He suffered for the sake of Christ. And so you would think, this guy, he is growing in holiness, man. He's like racking up holiness badges, right? And you'd probably think, if he's a Boy Scout, his holiness thing is like, dude, almost got martyred, right? got stoned, planted 10 churches. And that's what a lot of people, that's what I thought holiness was. I thought holiness was like, you start at white belt, and you're kind of leveling up in holiness, right? You're becoming this spiritual giant, and everyone's kind of beneath you, and you're like, hey, get to my level. Did you memorize Romans? I memorized Romans, because I'm that's what I kind of thought it was. Is that what's going on when you grow in holiness? That you kind of become this like super Christian? Isn't that so counterintuitive? How is that anything to do with your love and appreciation for Christ then? It's all about you. 
Look what I did. I sacrificed. I went on missions. I served the Lord. The Apostle Paul, what's fascinating about him, when you look at his life, the holier he gets, the lower view he has of himself. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians, the early years of his ministry, chapter 15, verse 9, he says, I am the least of the apostles. So it's like a humble brag. It's like I'm the least of the 12 people who've seen Jesus himself, right? It's kind of like that. It's like I'm, I'm still kind of a, 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 I'm, I'm like the man. Sure, I'm like of them, I'm the least, but I'm still kind of the man. Years later, Ephesians 3.8, what's interesting is his view of himself seems to lower. He doesn't say I'm the least of the apostles. He says I'm the least of all saints. So all saints, I'm the least. What's going on here? Why is his view getting worse? Did he, if anything, Scripture says he lived more in holiness. He lived more in following Christ. So why is his view getting deflated, not inflated? And third and last, near the end of his life, he says, this saying is trustworthy and in full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of who I am the worst. And Scripture would tell us and lead us to believe he actually believed that. He wasn't saying some sort of religious lingo or just trying to impress someone. He legitimately believed, I'm the worst sinner, and Christ came to die for me. What's going on here is what I would say is the paradox of truly experiencing the power of the gospel. Because as your understanding of God's holiness deepens, and that's why books like Leviticus are so important, what cannot help but happen is your awareness of your sin also deepens. And when God's holiness is rightfully appreciated, your sinfulness is rightfully recognized, do you know what stands in the gap? Amazing grace. The amazing, if you could put it in font, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the image that's really helpful. You get converted, and the pursuit of holiness in life is this never-ending growth in understanding God's holiness, which in turn reflects your sinfulness, which in turn makes the cross of Christ bigger and bigger, and bigger, and therein lies the power of holiness. In the same way that what he has done for you never changes, it says you actually start to get it. The same way that you understand what your mom has done for you. And the problem with this is a lot of Christians, particularly in our context, we seemingly think that we can be done with this reality, that we somehow mature beyond the gospel and we graduate from it, that we get it, Hey, I get it. I don't need this anymore. You know what ends up happening when that happens? This is a visual of what ends up happening. You stop understanding what the cross has done for you, and you start re-bringing yourself back into the picture. So some people, when they start to think, holiness is not this unachievable thing. I could actually kind of become holy. You know what ends up happening? You become religious. You become moralistic. You become legalistic and prideful. And the flip side, which I think a lot of us struggle with, when you forget how gracious the cross of Christ is, you start to fall right back into guilt, fear, shame, and insecurity. If I could put this in text version, this is what happens. If the gospel is only the ABC presentation you learned in vacation Bible school, then your understanding of what Christ did on the cross remains static, and over time you will either outgrow your immature faith, talk about a statement for our church, right, which results in religion, moralism, pride, or you will out sin, also describing a lot of our church, resulting in guilt, fear, shame, and insecurity. Meaning, if you're sitting here today and you feel like your duty and your moralism and your deeds are somehow righteous before the Lord, you have outgrown the gospel. And if you feel like somehow that you're not enough and you're unworthy and you've out sinned God, then you have out sinned the gospel, which are both impossibilities in scripture. So you've got it wrong. That's basically what it's saying here. And I think for many of us, I wonder if we should ask ourselves, have we functionally outgrown our faith? And the way you know this is this. Jesus is no longer as precious. The gospel is no longer as powerful. And the pursuit of holiness has gone cold. Three telltale signs that you believe you have outgrown your faith. I'm not sure about you guys. One of the biggest blessings of Leviticus for me is how much color and depth it has given to who Christ is and what he has done for me. When I first got converted, I heard Jesus died for me. Amen to that. Leviticus says, he didn't just die for you. He was your perfect high priest. When there was no way, he made a way for you to go to God. He wasn't just a high priest. He was a sacrificial lamb. Somebody needs to die to atone for your sins. And Jesus didn't send the lamb. He became the lamb. He didn't just die for you. He lived for you. All those laws that you're supposed to be perfect and you have to follow, 
You're no longer bound by it anymore. You know why? Because he fulfilled them perfectly. He was the perfect neighbor. He was the perfect citizen. He was the perfect friend. He was the one who sacrificed his all. Not only that, did you know you were unclean? And if anything touched you, it would become unclean. But Jesus, the clean one, became unclean for you so that now you're clean. That you're ritually cleansed. That God's not just giving you a pass. You are legitimately, rightfully entering his presence as clean because of what Christ has done. In other words, why am I a Christian full circle again? Because Jesus Christ has loved me, gave himself up for me, ever lives in resurrected glory to intercede on my behalf until he brings me home. And between now and when I go home to meet him until that day, I belong to him. I strive to live for him. And that's a small token and response for what he has done for me and who he is to me. When that registers, that's when pursuing holiness is the only option. Because you recognize, as Colossians says, but he has now reconciled you by his physical body to death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before me. Meaning for me, when I go back to this diagram right here, the why is no longer me, but as Galatians says, the me that once was the why has been crucified. It's been killed by Christ. And the why now is Christ. So to live is Christ. You guys kind of see what's going on here. To live is Christ. The life I now live, I live by faith in Christ. He has become my why, and that cannot help but change my what. So as we close, if you're not a Christian, I hope there's a little more clarity. There's a strong why behind the what of Christianity. I know a lot of times what Christians do is kind of funky and confusing, and we don't do it the best, but the why is unchanging. It's Jesus himself, who he is and what he's done. And if you are a Christian, I pray that you can truly reflect on that. Maybe it's been a long time. And you've forgotten. But that's why God himself is gracious giving us things like Lord's Supper. Let me remind you why. And as we do that, we can celebrate and be reminded of who he is. Let's pray.